The Sunrise Power Link gets its official dedication today with the governor, former governor, and protesters all on hand. I'm Dwayne Brown. Also tonight on Evening Edition, the debate over a proposed housing development next to the San Diego River. Some describe the site as a big pile of junk, but others say apartments and condos aren't the right fix. I'm Peggy Pico. Tonight on the Roundtable, we've got Robert Redford on the phone to talk about his son's new documentary, The Watershed, exploring a new water ethic for the New West. Plus, we'll give you details on how you can watch the London Olympics opening ceremony on the flight deck of the USS Midway. And we've had great white shark sightings along the San Diego shoreline tonight. A look at what's really lurking off our coast. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. The controversial Sunrise Power Link was dedicated today at a substation in San Diego's rural East County. Governor Jerry Brown, former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and other dignitaries turned out, and so did protesters. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson was there. San Diego gas and electric officials say the 117-mile-long transmission line is the largest infrastructure project the utility has ever undertaken. Jesse Knight is San Diego Gas and Electric's CEO. He says the power line will feed green energy to the San Diego region. In the past three years, we have signed eight renewable energy agreements for more than 1,000 megawatts, all of which is scheduled to flow through Sunrise Power Link. Energy reliability was a term often repeated during the dedication ceremonies. That took on added importance because the region's nuclear reactors remain shut down because of safety concerns. It's a major step forward. And thank God that we have this uh, transmission line with uh, the San Onofre out of commission. Uh, we need multiple sources of energy. We need lines of transmission. And yes, uh, it takes a lot of obstacles to get there. So the governor looks at this project as a conduit, a way to get green energy into San Diego County. But others look at this project and they see something different. They see something that's changing the face of the backcountry. The energy can be done in the city. There's over 7,000 megawatts of capacity on existing buildings, rooftops. Uh, you could put it over parking lots. You could do combined heat and power. You could do fuel cells, energy efficiency, energy conservation. That's where it needs to be done, where it's being used, not destroying the backcountry. Sunrise Power Link will allow the utility to help California meet its renewable energy goals. The state has set a goal to get a third of its power from green sources by 2020. Civilians working for the Defense Department could get layoff notices four days before the November election. Today, a Pentagon official laid out a timeline for what will happen if Congress doesn't take action to stop automatic budget cuts. Those cuts are scheduled to take effect on January 2nd. Workers have to get 60 days notice. That would be November 2nd. Election Day, of course, November 6th. The Defense Department has about 25,000 civilian workers in the San Diego area. A half dozen North County residents have been arrested in a nationwide crackdown on synthetic drugs. Federal agents call it Operation Logjam. They raided dozens of sites across the country. The synthetic drugs are known as bath salts and spice. They mimic the effects of cocaine, LSD, and methamphetamine. And they've become a popular alternative to those drugs. Bath salts and spice are illegal in California. A uh, follow-up now on our story about San Diego County's only licensed medical marijuana clinic. Yesterday, a bankruptcy judge gave a 45-day reprieve to the Mother Earth Alternative Healing Cooperative. It was supposed to be evicted from its site in El Cajon. The judge is giving the operator time to sort out its debts. But the U.S. Attorney's Office says Mother Earth is still operating outside federal law. In a written statement, it says... The stay may delay the eviction by Mother Earth's landlord, but it does not allow Mother Earth to operate a commercial marijuana business in violation of federal law, nor does it shield it from criminal liability. Today, the San Diego Planning Commission approved a controversial housing development along the San Diego River. KPBS reporter Tom Fudge joins us from the News Center. Tom, what can you tell us about the River Bend housing proposal? 
Well, Dwayne, the Riverbend housing proposal is a thousand home proposal. It's going to be mostly apartments and condos, and it's going to be located in the uh, neighborhood of Granville, right down by the San Diego River. In fact, it's going to be right between the San Diego River and Mission Gorge Road. Anybody who has been to Mission Trails Park knows this area. It's a very pretty area, although the uh, location where this housing development uh, is going to go is not very attractive right now. In fact, it's very industrial. And a lot of folks testified for and against this project, Tom. What were some of the pros and cons? Yeah, a lot of people uh, wanted to speak their mind in front of the San Diego Housing Commission, and a lot of them were very favorable toward this. Uh, one resident of Granville, Grantville, in fact, called the industrial site where this housing development is going to be a big pile of junk, and they think that this housing development will make it much more attractive. The buildings are going to be very attractive, and there's going to be a five-acre park right down by the river that is going to be part of this development that is going to allow people who live there and other people in San Diego to have some real access to the San Diego River. And that is uh, a problem right now with the San Diego River. It's kind of hard to get down to it. Now, the developer who's developing this project is Urban Housing Partners, and one of their executives is Sherm Harmer, and here's what he had to say about what he thinks is a very unique riverfront development. We added the housing to the river. We put parks and active recreation on the river. It's just unprecedented right now in San, in San Diego to have such an, a development, so we're happy to be the first. Now, Duane, on the other hand, there were a lot of people who spoke in opposition to this. In fact, a community planning group had voted against approval of this project, and their main concerns is that it's too dense and it's too tall. This isn't exactly going to be a high-rise development, but it's going to be about six stories tall. A lot of people think that's going to block off the river, and also the sheer population density of it they think is going to create traffic problems, more traffic problems in an area where uh, traffic is already a big problem. Yet uh, some folks call this smart growth, right, Tom? They do, despite all the traffic problems I just talked about. When you are trying to do smart growth, that means you're not doing sprawling developments. You're doing developments in areas that are already developed, and Grantville is a good example of that. Now, Sherm Harmer said the thing about infill development, as it's called, is if you don't want to build broadly, if you don't want to build out, you've got to build up. And that's why this is a six-story development. If you want to uh, not sprawl into the countryside, you've got to have a little bit of high-rise in the development. And so that's kind of where we are with this at uh, this point. All right, Tom, we know that it next goes to the city council to consider the housing proposal. Uh, KPBS reporter Tom Fudge. Right aid, right aid workers throughout Southern California are taking a strike vote tonight. Union leaders are urging them to reject the latest offer from the drugstore chain. They say Right Aid is asking workers to accept devastating cuts in health care benefits along with other concessions. The voting will continue through Monday. Right Aid has not commented. Twitter addicts were left high and dry for a while today, and the company says it's because two of its systems failed. Users had trouble accessing the social media site for about an hour. Twitter executives say they're working to make sure it doesn't happen again, especially since Twitter traffic is expected to increase tomorrow with the start of the Olympics. The London Games are coming to San Diego. The USS Midway will broadcast Friday's opening ceremony with giant screens on the flight deck. Peggy Pico is talking about the free public event over at the Roundtable. Most of the athletes from the Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista are already in London, but some are still in town and will be on board the Midway for the opening ceremony event. Scott McGaugh is the marketing director for the USS Midway Museum. Scott, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. Tell us about this event. It's free and it's open to the public. It is. Uh, gates open tomorrow night, Friday at 6.30 p.m. And it really is something we think for the entire community of San Diego to celebrate and honor San Diegans and others who will be representing our country in the Olympics. And there are a lot of other activities besides the televised uh, ceremonies. Go I mean, besides just the televised ceremony. Going yes, on. in addition to the large, uh, two large screen TVs that we'll have on the flight deck, uh, we're honored to have the BMX Olympic team will be with us tomorrow night. They haven't left for London yet, uh, so we'll have the entire team here. 
Uh, we will have archers who train at the center conducting demonstrations. We will have the Paralympian soccer team uh, doing juggling contests with kids, a variety of Olympic activities for families. And this is video of the uh, BMX riders. It's very exciting. Uh, it, it is. It's fast moving and exciting. And they're actually going to be um, signing autographs. Yes, they're going to be uh, uh, interacting with the crowd, signing autographs, taking photos with the kids. We're also going to have, thanks to the Olympic Training Center, an authentic Olympic torch where you'll be able to hold it maybe with a BMX athlete and get your photo taken. Oh, that's exciting. Tell us about, there's some other exciting stuff, well, maybe not for some, but the food definitely is going to have a British flair. Well, you know, you can't have an Olympic event uh, without uh, going uh, native, if you will. So uh, our Fantel Cafe is owned by a company that actually has been a, a caterer at previous Olympics. Uh, so they have a great deal of expertise, and they're going to be bringing British fare uh, to the flight deck board midway. Uh, Bangers and Mash is probably going to make its first ever appearance uh, on, the, on the flight deck of the USS Midway. <laughs> Which is, for those who don't know, sausage, mashed potatoes. And mashed potatoes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, and, and our, our uh, beverage service will probably have some libations that are more akin to British pubs uh, than what we see here. We really want to make it something of an immersive uh, activity for the entire family, uh, really uh, suitable for all ages. Right, absolutely. You said there was going to be, so it's for children. You recommend that people bring some long chairs and yes. uh, lightweight jackets, but tell us about parking. Uh, parking will be available, uh, paid parking uh, on the pier. The port operates uh, the, the parking lot, so parking will be available uh, on a paid basis on the pier. We always recommend public transportation. We're within walking distance of, of Amtrak and, and the trolley stations, and, and for events like this that we put together, as a community resource for San Diego. This is an opportunity that you can bring a lightweight lawn chair, a blanket, because it gets a little bit cool. Right. Uh, it's an outdoor picnic uh, on a gorgeous July night on the flight deck. Well, we don't have a whole lot of time. I just wanted to ask, we're expe you're expecting probably over 1,000 people. Yes. Why do this on the Midway? Well, you know, in a way, uh, it's, it's an opportunity for San Diego to celebrate the Olympics. And in a sense, you know, thousands of young men served our, our country in uniform uh, aboard Midway, and today we have athletes serving their country in a different kind of uniform on the athletic field. What better place to honor their dedication uh, to our country than on the flight deck of the USS Midway? Patriotic event. All right, Absolutely. Scott McGaugh, thank you so much for talking with us. My pleasure. A new documentary examines the power of a major source of water for San Diego County, the Colorado River, and how it's being sapped dry. Amitha Sharma talked to the producer about how the river has changed and affected communities who rely on it. Robert Redford and his son James Redford have produced a new documentary called Watershed, exploring a new water ethic for the new west. He joins me now by phone. Mr. Redford, what do people need to know about the Colorado River and how educated do you think they actually are about the state of the river? I don't know how educated they are because that would take some kind of polling that I'm, I, I'm not capable of doing. but. I think the main thing for people to know who, particularly those who consider the Colorado River an American icon, which a lot of people do, it's, it's sort of classified as a, a symbol of America and, and the, the beauty and good of America, that it no longer reaches its destination. <clears throat> Colorado River no longer reaches the Sea of Cortez, the Sea of California, and I don't think a lot of people know that, and that's a sign of something bigger, which is change, and I, I think that... Um, Change is inevitable, despite people that uh, are, seem to be afraid of change. It, it is inevitable. It's going to happen. And it's happening now very big and very fast. And certain things are disappearing or shrinking that would be a shock to us to, to learn about because it's happening so fast. And this is one of them. And I think there's a solution to this. I think that's the main thing to talk about is that you don't want to uh, uh, introduce something that there's no hope for. I don't think America does well with that. We want to know we can do something about it. Well, this is something we can do something about because we can restore the Colorado River to its destination if people get some facts. And the, and the film, I think, delivers all that information and the facts and what people can do about it. And, and what are the solutions? Well, the, the first thing is you have to look at, at this is obviously an issue of, of uh, demand exceeding supply so what is that demand what what about that demand as you as you look at that equation 
who represents the demand and there's some issues there there's some participants that probably don't need it you, uh, there's certain power plants that require a lot of water that maybe shouldn't even be there uh, or if they are there they can reorganize their their structures to not use so much water look at how water is used and look at the waste issue of how water is used because we waste a lot of water and the film shows how we waste that water and look at the supply. Look at exactly what that water does and what it supplies and, and what values it has in terms of what it does supply and what waste is uh, exercised with using water that isn't necessarily needed. How much water would you need for golf courses? How many golf courses do you need? And I love golf. But we're at a point now where we can't have everything we used to have. Otherwise, we're going to have nothing. So I think looking at it from that standpoint and then also knowing what people can do by contributing to the Colorado River Delta Water Trust uh, to, uh, is any donation of any kind when it gains momentum will help raise the money to buy water rights back from agriculture <clears throat> to put water back into its destination. So this documentary explores a new water ethic. What is that new ethic? Is how water is, the water ethic is looking hard at water. Don't look at water the way we've been looking at it for the past century or more, which is it's it's there forever. It, it's uh, something that's always going to be there for us. Therefore, we can use it to abundance. We can use it any which way we want because there's plenty of it that will always be there. Well, it won't. And this is an example of how it won't. So therefore, we better take a hard look at water to create a new ethic rather than anything, at, everything at all, all time. We have to be more conservative. We have to conserve our efforts in, in order to preserve such a priceless resource. You know, without water, we we don't exist. Who are some of the people who tell the story about the Colorado River in this documentary? Well, seven states are represented uh, by the Colorado River. Seven states use that water. That's that's a pretty big impact. Well, you look at ranchers. You look at <clears throat> you look at agricultural. You look at farmers actually depend on the water for their own sustenance, sometimes five generations of people, and how they use that water, and, and some of them show how they use it judiciously. You have a bike shop in Los Angeles that talks about how water means to him because it gets to Los Angeles. Los Angeles is dependent on that water, and San Diego is dependent on that water. I mean, there are all these cities that are dependent on that water, and we take a look at who some of those cities are and how that water is being used, but also how it's being wasted. And when you go into Colorado, the state, and you go into a little town like Rifle, which has a, an incredible mayor, he talks about how much water is used to extract oil or gas out of the earth. It's unbelievable, and people need to have this information. I think people just tend to not know what's really going on out there, and it's time we start paying attention to what is being threatened and what is shrinking and what may go away. I mean. And Mr. Sure Redford, like. we're going to have to wrap it there. I'm sorry to have to interrupt That's you. Okay. Thank you so much for coming You're sure on. welcome. Thank you. Bye. By the way, Peggy Pico will be moderating a discussion after Saturday's premiere of the documentary Watershed. We have more information about the event at kpbs.org. Now, earlier this month, the beach at La Jolla Shores was closed to swimmers after a great white shark was sighted offshore. While it's not the first time, it is a rare event. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy gives us a closer look at what's lurking in San Diego's hidden underworld. Scientists compare the waters off of California to Africa's Serengeti Plain for its richness of life. Most of the Pacific Ocean's top predators thrive there, including great white sharks. But San Diego's offshore dorsal finned residents are mostly harmless pups. We don't actually see too many large white sharks off of Southern California. Uh, they occasionally come through, but we don't have any resident fish, we think, in the area. Shark researcher Nick Wagner with Scripps Institution of Oceanography says San Diego waters provide a nursery ground for the five-foot-long great white newborns, but their parents tend to stay away. There's no parental care for white sharks. And so once the, the mom shark drops off the pups, she leaves and the pups are there to fend for themselves. And so the pups seem to end up off our coast in Southern California, and they're probably attracted to high abundances of fish, generally calm waters, and the area where they can best feel like they can survive. Wagner says the question that remains is exactly where females go to give birth. So we've never actually seen a white shark give birth, um, but because we have 
high numbers of, of juveniles. Um, in Southern California, we suspect that uh, they give birth somewhere uh, in Southern California or, or in adjacent waters. San Diego Lifeguard Lieutenant Greg Buchanan says mom does swim in close to shore on occasion to show off her large dorsal fin, most recently on July 2nd, when a lifeguard and eight witnesses spotted what they believed to be a 12 to 15 foot great white lurking off La Jolla shores. Swimmers were called out of the water and the beach was closed. The water was super clear that day, so we got a helicopter up within a few minutes. We had a rescue boat and jet skis and all the lifeguards looking. Buchanan says the big one got away that day, but he says shark sightings are on the rise. He says he receives about two to three credible reports every week. Our criteria is that if we find the uh, shark, the confirmed shark sighting within 500 yards of shore, we're going to basically consider the, a closure and then the area outside the 500 yards is what we'll describe as an advisory, which means we're going to tell everybody what we've seen and let them know that we're under a shark advisory and then they can choose to exit the water or not. Buchanan says the most common area for sightings is La Jolla. Here at La Jolla Cove, the seal and sea lion population is about 300. They're a great white's favorite meal and some researchers say they're the reason adult sharks occasionally come close to shore. <laughs> Wegner says La Jolla's marine mammal population pales in comparison to other California beaches. The National Marine Fisheries Service estimates there are more than 300,000 seals and sea lions along the California coast, a number that has exploded in the last 40 years since the passing of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Most of the large centers for white sharks are in larger areas where there's more abundant seals and sea lions and elephant seals. And so that's why we see an abundance of white sharks off the central coast. Near the Farallon Islands off of San Francisco, the other population center for adult sharks is off of Mexico's Guadalupe Island. But Chris Lowe, the director of the shark lab at Cal State Long Beach, believes La Jolla offers another draw for large sharks. One of the interesting things about La Jolla is you have that deep water canyon there, so it's possible that these sharks are staying deep and might periodically come up the canyon where they're exposed to shallower water. Wagner says great whites aren't the only large sharks off San Diego. So off the coast here we have a lot of mako sharks and blue sharks. Those are probably two of the most common uh, oceanic sharks, large sharks that we have off our coast. In the springtime we get thresher sharks which come through and they drop off uh, their pups um, in the spring and summer months and they um, and they can get quite large as well. Wegner says San Diego sharks are mostly harmless to swimmers. We've only had a couple of fatal shark attacks in the last hundred years in San Diego County. So shark attacks are very rare in, in, in San Diego and we always get, you know, there's always a lot of excitement generated when, when a white shark is spotted, but there's very, very few incidents with them attacking people. The Pacific Coast had 108 great white shark attacks recorded in the 20th century. Between 2000 and 2010, there were 54 attacks. Most victims survived. The latest fatality happened in 2008 off Solana Beach in North San Diego County. I would always tell people that sharks exist in the ocean, and so they need to know that. Uh, and then basically be aware and if you see anything that you think is unusual that, and you think might be a great white shark, they, they should tell a lifeguard immediately and then make sure that they stick around so that we can actually interview them and get first-hand knowledge of what they saw. Tonight on our public square, a shout out to Jonah Cohn of Del Cerro. He's the soon to be ninth grader from San Diego Jewish Academy who won first place in his age group at the International Google Science Fair. We talked with Jonah when he became one of the 20 finalists in the competition that had thousands of entries from more than 100 countries. His winning entry, dubbed Good Vibrations, distributes musical sounds to various parts of the body so those with hearing loss can hear it. Me and my friend came up with a way where you put your teeth on the very top of the guitar over here and you can hear it through the vibrations no matter how loud it is. Jonah was awarded a $25,000 scholarship for his project. He says his next goal is to create a mobile music device for people with hearing loss. To comment on this story or others you've seen here on KPBS, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, 
or email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. Recapping tonight's top stories, the Sunrise Power Link was officially dedicated in Alpine today. Eventually, it's expected to deliver 1,000 megawatts of power. Protesters say the line is a threat to the backcountry. The Pentagon says civilians working for the Defense Department could get layoff notices right before the November election. That's if Congress doesn't find a way to stop automatic budget cuts. Those cuts are scheduled to take effect on January 2nd, unless Congress finds other ways to reduce the federal deficit. Layoff notices have to go out 60 days before the cuts take effect. And a half dozen North County residents have been arrested in a nationwide crackdown on synthetic drugs. Federal agents call it Operation Log Jam. They raided dozens of sites across the country. The synthetic drugs are known as bath salts and spice. They actually mimic the effects of cocaine, LSD, and meth. And they've become a popular alternative to those drugs. Bath salts and spice are illegal in California. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.